The way we plan our cities and the way we move in our cities can make a huge impact in creating low carbon futures. This is what we are going to discuss in this video. My name is Sunny Kodukula and I work as a senior researcher at the Wuppertal Institute. I research and work on sustainable mobility topics in cities in emerging economies. Planning cities might be a new concept for many of us in the emerging economies. As a matter of fact, urban planning was not a defined department in many of our cities uh, until a couple of decades. Yet many cities in the developed world have gone through various cycles of urban planning principles and have a wealth of information for us to learn. Creating clean and livable cities has been an obsession for many urban designers and this led to some eyebrow raising concepts such as the garden city here and some that will follow. The garden city idea was conceived by Sir Ebenezer Howard in 1902. The idea was to improve the living conditions of the poor by creating satellite cities and by carefully allocating space to housing, industry and agriculture. Howard's idea on urban planning and the garden city movement itself has been an inspiration for present-day development of livable cities. Yet in this time, the cities that were planned were too close to the major uh, cities and as transportation improved, these cities acted as sleeper cities or dormitories for people working in the larger city. And if you think that congestion is a current day problem, then you might be mistaken. Here is a poster from 1925 that predicts that congestion can be solved by 1950 by building our way out. Tiered transportation services segregate vehicles with pedestrian traffic and the vehicles are again segregated in levels based on their speeds. Yet to this day congestion prevails and one thing that we continue to do in our cities is trying to build our way out of congestion. We still segregate the traffic with overpasses and flyovers. Here we see urban planning from another extreme. This is during the World War period. Urban planners in the US were contemplating on various urban forms that would result in minimum damage to society if there was a nuclear attack. Luckily these plans did not materialize. There has been another approach to building our way out as conceptualized by the visionary designer Le Corbusier. Again, you see wide roads for motor vehicles and pedestrians being lifted off the street on uh, raised platforms for walking. So here I want to talk about how urban planning and transport converge. This is relevant to our discussion on creating low carbon cities because the goal of low carbon cities is to produce as little carbon emissions as possible. So consider Atlanta in the United States, a city known for its love for automobiles and uh, the home for Coca-Cola. And the other city is Barcelona in Spain. Both these cities have roughly the same amount of population. Yet the space covered by Atlanta is about 26 times that of Barcelona. In terms of carbon dioxide emissions uh, from transportation, Atlanta produces about 10 times more emissions than of Barcelona's transport. And in terms of public transport, Barcelona has five times more public transport to use. Now, looking at how urban transport is planned in our cities, there is the traditional approach where the focus was on personal automobiles. This led to building infrastructure necessary for a free movement of automobiles. And the transport engineering and planning fields emerged. The traditional transportation planning has the concept of predict and provide. And this means the future automobile use was predicted with uh, calculations and modeling and the necessary infrastructure for the future automobiles was uh, provided. And also parking was deemed to be an essential requirement for motor vehicles and enough parking spaces were provided. And this approach was and is popular in many North American cities and was also adopted by many other cities in other countries. On the other side of the ocean, in Europe, there was also massive rebuilding happening after the war and many cities had to rebuild most of their uh, urban space entirely. And some of these cities have focused on retaining the green areas that their cities had before the war and also focus on maintaining the people-centered approach of their cities, especially in city centers. And this resulted in retaining the walking and cycling conditions in city centers, at least. 
And also while some European cities adopted the American model and fell in love with the automobile. Over time, cities that heavily adopted the traditional approach, i.e. focusing on automobiles, have realized that congestion levels were not reducing and the spatial demands of automobiles were never reducing. Cities were also growing in size as motorists now had the option to travel longer and faster on the highways. So they lived farther from the city center. Hence the city sizes grew. When more cars were added to the streets, the travel speeds reduced, resulting in congestion. Economists came up with the concept of induced demand. This in terms of non-economists such as I, mean that more roads we build, the more automobiles we will attract. Automobiles have an insatiable appetite for urban space. Once the space is consumed, we need to build vertically to accommodate more automobiles. On the other hand, public transport took the beating as government funds were not sufficient to run public transport for long distances and service quality was not good, so the image of public transport was not attractive anymore. Noise and air pollution is very common in automobile-oriented cities and so were the road accidents. The reduced road safety was also a bad sign for anyone not using a motor vehicle. After decades, many of our cities in emerging economies follow the traditional automobile-centric approach. This may be for various reasons. Uh, automobiles are seen as a status symbol and urban planners and transport planners in emerging economies are now in the driving seat to make the choice if they want to steer their cities along the same trajectories of our peers in, in the, following the traditional approach to transport planning or do we move to a different trajectory. So should we also start building our way out? And let's see some more ways to address this question. While North America was busy building for the automobile or the car, some European cities have built cities around public transport, expanded their rail networks and planned for people at the center. As mentioned earlier, they have kept the focus on people in the city centers and expanded their public transport networks. Here are some cities with similar population levels and the extent of car and public transport use. You can see the two European cities, Vienna and Berlin, have over 50% mode share by public transportation. That is, more than 50% of trips are made by public transport. While Houston in Texas, United States, has about 96% of trips done by personal automobiles, predominantly cars. And Vancouver in Canada has about 80% of trips done by private modes. Also, the major highways are marked in red, so you see that major car-dependent uh, cities like Houston uh, have more highways than Berlin or Vienna, where public transport is predominantly used. A colleague of mine and I mapped the relation between urban density and public transport use, out of curiosity, in some cities, and we found that in cities where public transport is well developed and developed along the needs of the users, there is a high share of use of public transport as density increases. And some examples include Paris, Barcelona and Spain. Mumbai also has a very high public transport use as the city is very favorable for public transport uh, because it is a linear city and urban rail use is very high. And some things that are very common in cities that have high use of sustainable transport modes uh, such as walking, cycling and public transport are density, land use, focus on public transport and active modes and urban design and overall integration of all these aspects. Integration is the secret sauce for successful low carbon cities. Integration is not rocket science, it is mindful planning with people as the focus. In simple terms, integration should be done such that the access to public transport walking and cycling are increased. Uh, different forms of land use are integrated into one parcel such that the trips can be shortened and fewer trips are made. And integrating transit planning and urban planning so that there are synergies between these two. 
and integrating walking and cycling in urban planning so that the short trips that are made are done by these active modes. The factors that can help us in developing the low carbon transport and urban planning are the three Ds, as Robert Cervero puts in his research paper and in his latest book, Beyond Mobilities. The research paper is referenced in our reading list section. So these three Ds are density, diversity, and design. And let's see what each of these mean. Professors Newman and Jeff Kenworthy uh, have plotted uh, this relationship uh, between urban density and energy consumption for transport. The graph clearly shows that denser the city is, lower is the energy consumption for transport. So in the graph you see that the European cities are in the middle and the dense Asian cities are more to the right and the sparse North American cities are high in energy consumption for transport because they have very low densities. And this is also in line with the story I was telling you earlier on the approaches to urban planning and transport planning. So yes, we agree that density makes an impact, but are there any qualifiers to density? Having two high-rise buildings a kilometer apart can also create urban density, but is that what we are talking about? Well, high density does not mean high-rise buildings. We, what we want in our cities is a uniform mid-rise development. Maintaining the mid-rise density is essential. So say if there are 10 floors in a building, having 8 floors for residential units and the remaining 2 floors for other purposes such as retail and commercial can make a difference. The second D for in our 3Ds is for uh, diversity. Here comes the concept of zoning. And zoning is a practice that is widely followed both in Europe and in North America and in many other countries. And what zoning does is zoning designates land parcels for specific use. If you see the picture here from Los Angeles, a majority of the zoning is for single-family detached housing. So as you move away from the downtown, you see large swathes of land taken up by uh, single-family houses. And this not only goes against the first D, that is density we saw earlier, it also does not create any diversity. It is either all housing or all retail or commercial or office space. And the problem with this approach is that one has to drive from residential areas to the office and then drive again to the retail areas, which increases the number of trips made by motor vehicles. The distances are so far that cycling or walking is not feasible and public transport cannot serve all the locations as it would not be economical to operate such a transit system. On the other hand, if zoning allowed for multiple or mixed uh, purposes of land use, it would be possible to have a convenience store or a grocery store in the same place where people lived, have commercial and retail places in residential spaces, and the streets are designed such that walking and cycling is possible. The result is what you see in this picture from Buenos Aires in Argentina. It creates a vibrant community with social interaction. Density and diversity together can make transit very viable and walking and cycling very attractive. The third D is for design. And a proper people-centric design is the final nail in the coffin. A people-centered design brings out the true purpose of our cities. Our cities are meant for interaction among people and people talking to each other rather than honking at each other sitting in their cars. Cities are meant to have nice green parks and not tall car parks. And following people-centered planning reorients our planning approaches towards the needs of the majority of the people. You may have seen this picture that is shown here in other forms elsewhere. And this picture is from Buenos Aires and shows the number of vehicles needed to transport a group of people and the same number of people 
when transported on bicycles and a bus. From this, it must be clear where our design-related focus should be. If you have not yet guessed, let me help you. It has to be on walking, cycling and public transport because they are more efficient than everyone driving their own vehicle. And creating streets with walking and cycling in mind can also create vibrant streets. And here's an example again from Buenos Aires. For automobile users, it sends a clear signal that they are not the sole users of the street, but they are just another user of the street space and pedestrians, cyclists and public transport users also belong to the street. And considering people-centered design can also make us think creatively when we provide information. Here is a transit route map showing all the cultural and recreational options available for transit users. And focusing on walking can also be very beneficial for businesses because businesses, especially due to lack of awareness, are under the impression that their customers are only those who come by personal automobiles. But several researchers have shown that pedestrianizing commercial areas result in higher business volumes than car-oriented commercial areas. Properly integrating land use and public transport is what is known as transit-oriented development. The basic idea is to create people-centered urban areas around transit stops. The inner core, or about 300 meters around the transit stop, is a high density core with mixed land use and this is depicted in the dark blue circle this means that 300 meters around the transit stop is there for both residential and commercial activities and as we go further out the densities would reduce and will lead to more residential areas and this is done to about 500 meters to one kilometer around the transit station. While developing transit oriented development, it is important to keep in mind the features that are offered to pedestrians, cyclists and transit users. Proper planning and implementation is crucial. Keeping in mind design that favors active mobility users' needs will make uh, a TOD successful. A properly designed and implemented transit oriented development can also bring additional revenues to the city. Barcelona's approach to addressing urban planning and low carbon transport has been very popular lately. Barcelona implements something called super blocks. These super blocks are designed from existing urban areas. Land parcels are bundled together such that each bundled parcel is served efficiently by transit services and within each bundle the streets are closed for motor vehicles unless you are a resident in the area and even these vehicles may move only in one direction while bicycles and emergency vehicles may access the street space in both directions streets are redesigned to allow more pedestrian activity and this is done by removing parking altogether or drastically reducing on-street parking availability and giving this reclaimed space back to the people. The results of implementing super blocks is impressive. The pedestrian space dominates the area after implementation due to increased space for active mobility. The accessibility in super blocks is improved. Since more space is actually allocated for people, the livability index of public space is drastically improved. So, so far in this video, we have seen that there are two types of approaches. The traditional approach, which focuses on automobiles, and the sustainable approach that focuses on people and their needs. Low carbon transport means walking, cycling, and public transport, or transit. There are three Ds for developing low carbon mobility or low carbon cities. The first D stands for density. And when we talk density, it means uniform density, and not just density created by a couple of high-rise buildings. And the second D stands for diversity or mixed land use, which means giving retail, commercial and residential purposes to one parcel of land. And the third D stands for people-centric design. Integrating land use and transport is at the core of creating low carbon cities and low carbon transport. Transit-oriented development is integrating transit mindfully with land use around the transit station and this means bringing in density and diversity around transit stops and making transit accessible for active modes of transport. 
The traditional approach gives us cities that are extremely dependent on personal automobiles and brings various negative externalities, such as air pollution, noise pollution, congestion, and deteriorated road safety, while sustainable approach to urban design and urban transportation planning gives us cities that are created for people and focuses on transport systems that move people. In the next videos in this section, we'll talk about how planning for public transportation happens and planning for walking and cycling and how we can embed innovative transport solutions such as electric mobility in our cities. Also, don't forget to visit the reading list section as you may find some interesting material and some links to videos that may be of your interest. That's all from me in this video and thanks a lot for watching and see you in another video.